everyone and welcome to this episode of the ELT CPD podcast and the third and final episode of our How to Write mini series. In our first episode, we spoke to Tyson Seaburn about how to write inclusive materials. Then we spoke to Catherine Billsborough about how to write primary materials. In this episode, we're speaking to teacher, materials writer and IA TEFL's MORSIG coordinator, Alex Popovsky, about how to write your own teaching materials. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hi, Billy. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and to have a chat. Thank you for the invitation. So today we're talking about teachers making their own materials. Um, so this was a topic suggested by you. So I'm excited to hear all about you and all about your teaching experience and your materials writing experience. So maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about yourself, who you are and where you're from. Well, um, I'm an English language teacher and I've been teaching for almost 25 years now. I'm originally from Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but uh, now I'm in uh, North Macedonia. And um, that's where I have my own language school. Uh, so I teach on a daily basis. And I think that helps me a lot to keep in touch with you know, um, uh, students, learners, uh, what they need, what they want. And that helps me when I write my uh, materials. Definitely. Yeah. Um, have you been out of the classroom for a period of time or have you always maintained a relationship with, with students? No, I've been in the classroom for 25 years. Amazing. Yeah. Never um, a day off unless um, I, I, I'm i sick or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important, isn't it, to just keep that connection to the classroom. Yeah. I think it is very, very important. And are you a Definitely. coordinator at IA TEFL as well? Is that right? Yes, um, I'm coordinator for the IA TEFL Materials Writing SIG. And right now I'm in my second uh, term. And to be honest, I've enjoyed every uh, single minute um, of uh, being part of MOSIG because um, I work with some great people and I've met some great people through IA TEFL and MOSIG. So uh, it really is an important and enjoyable part of my professional life. That's great. And what does that entail? What do you have to do for it? As a coordinator, I need to make sure that um, everything we do is according, first of all, to the ITEFL policies. Um, and uh, I uh, need to oversee everything that we do. So, you know, publications, uh, events, uh, even the, the tech side of things. Uh, we do have uh, our coordinators for that. Um, we always discuss things together. We make decisions together. Uh, we have our weekly meetings, mm -hmm. and that's when we uh, talk about what we want to do next, what we need to prepare for. Uh, and I'm in um, daily communication with uh, the IATEFL head office as well. Great. And how did you personally get into materials writing yourself? Did you start creating your own materials as a teacher, first of all? Yes, um, that was the first thing that I did, uh, maybe about 10 or 11 years ago. Um, and then when I started my MA um, in the UK, I decided that that would be the focus of my thesis. So my thesis, my MA thesis is actually on materials development. Okay. So okay. Um, it, so things just kind of connected, you know, and clicked. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been writing materials for my classroom ever since. Excellent. So what do you think the benefits are for teachers to create their own materials? Why should teachers consider it if they're not doing it already? Well, I think that the greatest benefit is that you know your students, you know their needs, you know their interests. And, you know, we always talk about that when we talk about writing materials, you yeah. need to know the learner's needs and interests. And it's difficult to do that uh, when writing for a global market, for example. Mm -hmm. But when you write for your own classroom, it's completely different because you know your students. I have students who have been with me for 10 years. You know, I've seen them grow up. Um, so you, you do know them, and that mm -hmm. helps a lot. So you can create these tailor-made materials, something that will fit your uh, students. Um, although I don't think that there are perfect DLT materials, to be honest, mm -hmm. but I think that we can be close to that, especially when you write for your own classroom. And so if you're creating materials, as you say, for a specific class, is there a way to reuse that or recycle it perhaps? It, because if you are being very specific to your particular learners mm -hmm. at a time, maybe one year later, you might have different students. Do you think it's worth creating something that you can also recycle or should you do it specifically for classes? 
No, exactly. I think that um, that's that's a great benefit again of these uh, materials when you create them for your own classroom. You can easily adapt them. Mm -hmm. You know, because even when you use someone else's materials, you adapt them to your own students' needs and, and interests. So you basically just tweak them a little bit yeah. so that they fit that particular group of students. Mm -hmm. uh, and with your own materials, it's even easier because you know why you uh, wrote them in the first place and what you wanted to achieve with your materials. Mm -hmm. So it just needs a little bit of tweaking here and there. And do you remember some of the first materials you wrote? Do you remember like your first venture into it? Yes, actually, I think that my first attempt was um, writing materials for, I think it was a reading text. I, I needed to, um, I needed my students to read something about, oh yes, vlogging. Okay. Vlogging was kind of, a, you know, uh, not that popular at the time, and I wanted them to learn something more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I'm, I, I really love reading, and I love reading comprehend, reading about reading comprehension and reading strategies. I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. Right. Uh, and so that was uh, the first thing that I've uh, ever written. So it was a text about blogging, followed by some uh, activities um, and. Well, maybe it was not that successful at first. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I must admit. But, you know, nothing is um, a success immediately. Uh, I had to change them and, you know, tweak them a little bit. Uh, but they worked well, you know, considering it being my first um, ever written uh, thing. Definitely. Yeah, I think, well, like anything, isn't it? The more you do something, the better that you become as well. I guess that's the same for writing your own materials, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Exactly. Would you say there's any disadvantages to creating your own materials as a teacher? Um, I think that the greatest disadvantage is lack of time. Mm -hmm. You know, writing materials is extremely time consuming. Yeah. And um, I would say that, you know, people see writers as people who sit down and they write, I don't know, a book in a week or you know, when they think about ELT materials, they think that we sit down and we write one unit in like two hours. Yeah. But actually, there is a lot of work behind writing material. Um, you know, you have to do your research, you have to do your design and everything that is part of uh, writing ELT materials. And as teachers, you know that we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. You know, our working conditions don't allow us yeah. uh, to spend hours and hours creating material. So I think that's one disadvantage, the first disadvantage that I would um, ever uh, mention about writing materials for your own classroom, you really need to find time to do that. It is very, very time consuming. Definitely. And what would you say to a teacher who's sort of put off by the fact that it, it takes time? Like if it's just easier to pick up a course book, although it might not be as engaging for your learners, maybe it's just easier. Is there any advice you'd give to someone who is worried about the time aspect of it? Is there a way to shorten it perhaps? Um, I think that uh, perhaps in that case, um, a teacher could just uh, add something to the materials the teacher yeah. is already using. Um, and I think that's the easiest way to start. And, you know, of course, in the beginning, everything is difficult. You don't know exactly what you're doing when you're sitting there in front of, a you know, your screen or a piece of paper, because I still start writing <laughs> my materials by hand. So I need my pencil and my uh, piece of paper. Yeah. Um, the easiest way is to start just kind of adding things to the uh, to the published materials. And then gradually, as you learn what is uh, materials writing and how to do it, then you can maybe devote some time uh, every week just to uh, writing some material for your own classes. Uh, and then I think over time, you kind of get used to the process, it becomes um, faster and easier, and then um, it might not be that time consuming. That's a really good piece of advice, actually, just adding to things. So it could be something like discussion questions or sentence writing. Or... Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good. Idea. Or just a simple, you know, additional speaking activity, mm -hmm. you know, just to see whether it would work yeah. in the classroom with your uh, students. So something that is simple and easy to do, you know, even adding, a, a, I don't know, a crossword puzzle to the 
published materials yeah. with the vocabulary you want to recycle with your students. That's also part of materials writing. You know, you still need to write instructions. You still need to design the material. So uh, anything, anything that can supplement the published material is your own material. Um, and then you just kind of start uh, growing in that area and writing more and more and faster. That's really good. Do you think that you need to take a course in materials writing or do you think it's something that you can just develop on your own? Well, um, to be honest, I think that professional development for materials writers is something that is uh, at this moment lacking. Uh, I was lucky to have a module on materials development during my uh, MA mm -hmm. and I really enjoyed it. I, I believe that you need some kind of professional development in that area, yeah. whether it's just the recommended reading list, because there are quite a lot of books out there on materials development uh, today. Uh, the situation was completely different, maybe, I don't know, um, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. But now we do have research. We do have books that are primarily about materials development. And of course, now we have even more uh, talks um, at conferences about materials writing. We have a lot of webinars because I think that the whole industry is um, changing and everybody understands and sees that we need quality ELT yeah. materials. And I believe that if you as a teacher and a materials writer, if you do not invest in your professional development, then you cannot grow and develop as a professional. Yeah. So I think that it's very important to work on that. That's true, isn't it? I'm just thinking about some of the ELT sort of supplementary qualifications, like a CELTA and DELTA, and I, I can't remember personally there being anything on materials writing. I mean, there was a curriculum development in the DELTA, but you didn't have to make the materials, you could use course books and things, so... Um, I think that there is uh, something in um, the um, Trinity, mm -hmm. uh, TESOL, I think that there is um, uh, part of it that is dedicated to materials development because I was mm -hmm. considering doing it at one point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I liked about it is that they had that com component on materials development. Yeah. As you say, all teachers inevitably write something at some point for their students. So... Yeah, I guess exactly. it's good to just sort of grow and develop. What type of materials, um, so you've said sort of supplementing coursework materials, but what other types of materials might teachers consider making for their classes? I think that a lot of teachers, well, I would say not a lot of teachers, most teachers are extremely creative. Mm -hmm. And I think that they need to focus that creativity and put it into something that they can use and reuse with their um, students. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that a lot of teachers also create their, um, you know, whole units of material, yeah. uh, something that they can use for a longer period of time and then recycle and reuse with um, other groups. Also, there is always a, a possibility of um, doing uh, some of their own worksheets, uh, writing even, I know some teachers even write stories for their own classes followed with activities for their students. Um, I know that I do that. Um, I, I love reading and I love literature and I love writing stories and reading stories um, with my students. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that we can um, honestly find a lot of um, creative teachers, storytellers um, out there. Uh, so it's not just about, um, you know, creating a couple of activities or exercises to supplement the published materials, but it's also creating a, a, a whole set of uh, materials so it can be anything literally so maybe you could use the materials oh, say for example let's go for a classic topic of shopping you could create a whole mm -hmm. section rather than like to replace the course book you mean or yeah. exactly mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um you know we talk about a, a lot of things in published materials but we also don't talk about a lot of things in published materials. And I think that uh, another great benefit of writing your own materials is that you can include things that um, are usually not there because of, you know, the parsnip thing. Um, so you can create a whole unit, let's say, on, um, I don't know, uh, disabilities. That's not something that you can find in published materials as a standalone uh, unit, for example, mm -hmm. you know, it's always just the snippets, always something that 
connects a text or an image to a disability, mm -hmm. but you never actually discuss that. So teachers in that way, they're allowed, they can, there is nobody to tell them that they cannot do that. So they can uh, do a whole uh, set of materials uh, to work on with their students. So that's another, as I said, benefit of, of doing this. You can talk about anything that you want. As you said, shopping, for example, uh, shopping in, in published materials is rarely connected to sustainability, you know, um, and environment. And maybe that is something that you can write about as a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, not just supplement, but replace the whole unit and focus on, on, on shopping uh, in connection to, to sustainability and environment. You can talk about whatever you want, you can write about whatever you want, and you can devote as much time um, to that to particular topic um, as you want. That's really great, yeah. Um, just in case we've got any sort of new teachers listening, could you, if possible, just define what you mean by parsnips? I know you mentioned them briefly. That's uh, a list of topics that are taboo topics in uh, the publishing industry, and that is something that we should not uh, mention and include uh, in when writing ELT materials. So uh, we should not talk about politics and um, alcohol and racism and sex and narcotics ism i'm just going letter by letter now yeah, yeah, yeah. i hope i don't forget uh, um, anything uh, and um, uh, pork but uh, from what i can see i think this is this list is going to grow mm -hmm. that we will be including more and more uh, topics that we won't be allowed to talk about Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things happening around the world, and I think that that will influence the choice of topics in the ELT materials. But if you write your own materials, you can easily uh, avoid uh, that constraint and you can write about whatever you think your students would be interested in. Are there any guidelines or any suggestions that you think material... Um teachers and materials writers should follow because essentially teachers are materials writers. So are there any sort of suggested guidelines that you would recommend for them? Um, well, when I was writing my, my thesis, I focused a lot on the principles of uh, materials writing and materials development. And I think it's important to have your own set of principles. Mm -hmm. These principles um, are not um, generally uh, accepted, to be honest. And uh, there has been a lot of writing about materials, uh, writing principles. Uh, but I think that every teacher or every materials writer, um, we need to have our own set of principles. So something that will give like a framework for us. So something to follow as we develop uh, materials, whether for our own classroom or for a publisher. Um, I also believe that it's very important, uh, as I said, to be aware of the needs and interests of your students. Um, not so easy for the global market, but um, you know there's market research, so you can uh, that can help you uh, quite a lot. Um, also, a lot of times teachers forget that um, it's not just about the content that you write; it's also about the design uh, yeah. of the materials that you write. Um, and what I do is I follow the, the design principles of web creators, web designers, mm -hmm. and they have quite a lot of principles, but I usually follow uh, the basic 12. Mm -hmm. And I try to base my materials uh, design on that. So how to organize them, organize them, what goes where, with what, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's very important then to have a framework to have your own set of principles and to have also follow certain design principles, um, especially if you have students uh, who have a learning disability. So you need to make sure that your materials are designed in a way um, that they can use them, that they can read uh, a text, for example. So I think those are the things that to keep in mind, first of all. So you need to have your own principles and you need to have uh, design principles uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, we need to invest in our professional development. Mm -hmm. So find books, watch web webinars. When you are at a conference, try to find talks and materials writing. Um, you know, learn from others. Uh, if you want to write a new set of materials, ask uh, a colleague before that 
whether they would be willing to pilot the, the, the material for you so that you can see if it works. Because if I decide to pilot my own materials with my own students, I would be very subjective. Mm -hmm. So maybe that objectivity would be lost and no, it would definitely be lost. So ask someone else to look at your materials and try them with their students. Um, and then you will have a, a very clear picture of what works well and what doesn't work well. Yeah, because yeah. what you think might work for your class might not work on a global scale or even with your own language school, you know, or other classes. That's right. The teacher might instruct differently and which in turn might change the whole activity, you know, definitely. Exactly. Um, and... Uh, now that you mentioned instructions, I think one of the, the, the greatest mistakes is that when teachers start writing materials, they think that they're in the classroom and that their students can actually hear the instructions, but they cannot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as if someone else uh, is piloting your materials, let's say tomorrow, you know, they, they need to have really um, clear and good instructions written by you. Mm -hmm. So your instructions need to work for you but also for someone else and for your students, because you write, write teacher, let's say, you know, guides, and then you have the materials for, the, for your students. Mm -hmm. The instructions need to be very clear so that everybody can use the materials. Definitely. So I think that's something that we forget, you know, you, you are not in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You are not reading the instructions to your students. They will need to read them on their own or another teacher will have to give them do you always write teachers notes for any materials you make because from my experience I remember I yeah. never wrote teachers notes and I would just design um the activity on a piece of paper and then like try and remember how to use it later you know like would you recommend always writing instructions yes that's what I always do mm -hmm. so I create I start writing the materials and then I um at the same time, I make notes, teachers' notes okay. uh, that then I write out. Uh, so just in case I want to share with some some of my colleagues, you know, other teachers, or maybe to put on online. Although I rarely put any of my materials online, mm -hmm. um, it's not a habit that I have. Let's just say, but I think it's very important that as you are working on the students' material, you need to work on the teachers' notes as well at the same time. I think it's much better. We forget, yeah. you know, so it might um, be something that you really like and you think that it would work, you write it down, but then you forget certain details mm -hmm. and you can't remember them later. But if you put them in the teacher's notes, then it's much easier. And how would it change if you're teaching online? Could you still create your own materials or is it a different ball game, do you think? Well, I think it depends on how prepared you are to deal with all the technology. But um, I always say um, that things online should not be complicated. They should be just really simple. So I think that we can adapt a lot of our materials to online environment. Uh, it just needs a little bit of more um, kind of thinking in terms of technology. What can I use instead of this? You know, and what can I do? to replace this part in the book um, so that I can make it interactive online. Um, now with all these apps, you know, and web tools that we have, I think it's so easy um, to uh, create um, and adapt materials to the online environment. But again, I think that we should also keep the, the number of apps and web tools that we use to the minimum. because. Mm -hmm. uh, the the more complicated things get the, the the worse it gets for the teacher and for the students um so when we moved to teaching online i had to adapt quite a lot of my materials to that environment but i decided to only use a couple of of, of apps and web tools because i didn't want to make my um life difficult or um you know my students um as well so it was, you know, Zoom as a platform to communicate, PowerPoint to show uh, the materials, and then, you know, things like Padlet and uh, Mentimeter, and of course, um, Zoom's uh, whiteboard. So we could draw and do things and write things and do uh, different activities with that. So I think that now uh, we, when we write uh, ELT materials, we need to think about the online component immediately, you know. Okay, so I'm writing this for my classroom face-to-face, -face, but 
in case I need to be online again, how can I use these materials online? Mm -hmm. So now we have the, you know, more responsibility and it's even more work for us as teachers and materials writers, because we need to think about two different environments. You mentioned um, Padlet and Mentimeter. Are there any other sort of digital resources yeah. that you would use to create activities? Um, well, it depends on what I want to, to achieve. So sometimes I use, you know, what was the name of it? Oh, God, I keep forgetting that. And that's one of the things that I loved most. Uh, it's for creating comics um, oh, okay. because I love using comics and um, graphic novels. Okay, nice. Is it, um, is it a free tool? Like a make believe. Yeah, it's free. Make believes comics. Make believe. Yeah, comics. that's the one. So it's one of my favorite um, tools because um, I like to create a comic mm -hmm. uh, that actually is um, my lesson for the day. Okay. Uh, so it's my reading text. It can also become my listening. It, it is also the source of grammar and any kind of vocabulary. Yeah, so um, as I said, I'm interested in using uh, comics and graphic novels uh, in DFL classroom. So that's why I like to use them as materials, actually. Yeah. Um, and I use graphic novels as well. Uh, so I think that's one of the most creative um, tools that I use to create materials. I want to be in one of your classes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It sounds really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Billy. <laughs> um, how do you know, obviously you know your students personally, but how can a teacher know whether their students are actually going to enjoy these materials that teachers have put all their time and effort into making? You never know, as I said. You, you, you can never guess how um, a lesson would go. It can go either way. It can be really good or really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that one a very important uh, signal is how engaged they are during that lesson using the, the materials. If there is engagement, if there is communication, uh, but of course we need to understand that not all of our students will be engaged and uh, not all of them will uh, communicate. Uh, but if you can see that there is, you know, uh, communication, they're talking to each other, they're doing the work, then you know that the materials um, are uh, working with your students. Um, as I said, you can never be sure. I mean, nobody can be sure about anything that they do, whether it's going to work or not. It's, you know, something that we just need to be very optimistic about. And uh, when we sit down and write materials, uh, I think one important thing is to imagine yourself with your students in the classroom using the materials that you have planned to, to write. Uh, think about all the, the, the things that could go well and all the things that could go wrong and try to figure out a solution. You know, do I have a student in my class <clears throat> who misbehaves quite a lot due to different you know, reasons? So what can I do to keep that particular student uh, engaged? Mm -hmm. You know, can I give uh, that student a, a different activity? Um, you know, something that is just for that student? Uh, maybe I have a, a student who is really shy and doesn't like to talk, um, doesn't like to work with others. So what can I do about that? So, so that's why these uh, materials that we create for our own classroom, that's why they can work really well, mm -hmm. because you know what the, the strengths and weaknesses of your materials um, are. But as you said, if you see communication, if you see work, if you see engagement, uh, if you have a lot of questions from your students about whatever uh, they're doing uh, during that class, then your materials are, are uh, really good. I mean, I can always do a checklist, you know, um, you know, when we uh, kind of look at materials and we want to make sure that they're good, you know, we can use a, a checklist. But um, a checklist only tells you whether the organization of the material is good, uh, whether the, the layout is good, whether the content is good, whether, you know, the grammar that you included is um, okay. But it, a checklist cannot tell you whether the materials uh, will work or not in your classroom. Mm -hmm. You need to see yourself or, as I said, pilot it with uh, another teacher and see uh, if they, uh, if the, the materials work in that particular classroom. Definitely. And I guess if you if you have the student at the center of the materials that you're writing, as you just suggested, then perhaps you're creating around topics and things that they're interested in. So it's more personalized to them. So 
then hopefully it will be more engaging for them rather than just a course book which is made for every well, everybody I say in inverted commas yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly you know that's um that's what I said you, we know our students and we know what they like and what they don't like because we talk to them and uh, especially teenagers they're so self-absorbed and they love talking <laughs> about themselves and the things that they like okay so it's quite easy I, I think to um, find a topic that they will like because you will hear them talking about you know, a, a, a particular photo or, uh, on Instagram or a TikTok that they saw. Okay. And then you can use that mm -hmm. in your material. Yeah. And there's your interest. There is your engagement automatically. Definitely. So, yeah, just listen to your students. Listen mm -hmm. to, to, to them talking to each other during breaks. We can find out a lot about them from there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we have a question from a listener. So do you have any advice on how to organize all the materials you make as a teacher? I've written probably hundreds in the past on pieces of paper that I have to sift through every time I want to use one. Mm, okay. Um, well, I would suggest first categorizing them, mm -hmm. maybe according to level and skill, uh, and then just put them in little boxes. Mm -hmm. And then again, write the skill and the level on that box so you don't have to go through a pile of paper. Um, or now, because of all this technology, you can digitize them. Mm -hmm. You know, you can um, kind of uh, take a photo of a piece of paper you can um, convert it into a Word document. You can tidy it up a little bit and you have your uh, materials in a, in, in a digital format. Yeah. You know, it's not that difficult to do that nowadays, as I said, with all the technology. But I think finding a system to categorize them would, would be excellent. So yeah. level and skill or maybe even include age. So it depends on the, the teacher's context. Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea, actually. Um, and when we first started talking about this episode initially, you sort of suggested this episode because you wanted teachers to think of themselves as materials writers. Um, why do you think that's important? I think it's very important because I believe there is this misconception that, that you are not a materials writer uh, just because you're not a published writer. Mm -hmm. It's a huge misconception. Um, I believe it's not uh, true and we need to change that. Uh, I wouldn't say that all teachers are material, materials writers, not everyone writes materials to the classroom, but I would say that most of us, uh, we are uh, materials writers. Uh, and uh, I believe that it's important to tell teachers that they are materials writers. They don't have to have their uh, name on, on a cover of a course book published by a big uh, publishing company. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think that, for me, the satisfaction is seeing my materials used with my students and working mm -hmm. uh, well for them. So we need to change that. Also, that's what we are trying to do at MOSIG. We want uh, our members and non-members, of course, um, to see that MOSIG is not only for published authors. It's for anyone who writes uh, ELT materials mm -hmm. for your own classroom, for your own school. It doesn't matter. You don't need to be a published author to be considered a materials writer. I think for myself, I taught for nine years before. Well, obviously I was writing materials, but before I decided to sort of stop teaching and write full time and I didn't know about things like Morsig. I didn't know anything. I had to go to a conference and speak to <laughs> someone that I've actually spoken to on the podcast, Sue Kay, um, and she gave me lots of advice and places to look. I'm just going to spell more SIG. So it's M-A-W-S-I-G. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Um, and how can people yes. join that? And are there any other organizations or things that you'd recommend? Well, um, we are part of IA Keffel, mm -hmm. as you know, uh, the International Association of Teachers as a, of English as Foreign Language. Um, and uh, if you join IATEFL, uh, as an individual member, you can join the SIG for free. Um, so you can join Materials Writing SIG. We are quite active. We have our own uh, blog where you can find a lot of practical um, tips and uh, ideas. We also run webinar series. And we had, I think it was about three years ago, we had a webinar series on how to 
-hmm. So how to write a teacher's book, how to uh, write, I don't know, uh, listening materials. Mm -hmm. So we covered like all the skills and all the basics. So I think it's important to be a part of a, of a group. Uh, I think that there isn't another group that is dedicated solely to materials writing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Mossig uh, is the only group uh, that does that group of ELT professionals. Yeah, we try to offer as much support and help as we can to uh, teachers who write their own materials, also to those who uh, write materials for publishers. I think it's just really opened my eyes to how to improve, how to better myself as a teacher and a writer. And I think it's just great to know, because it's obviously, especially if you're teaching online, to know that you're part of a community. And even though you don't know these people, you know, everyone's in the same boat at the end of the day. So, yeah, it's really nice to be part exactly. of something like that. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. I think that it's very important to belong to a, a professional group. You know, because that's something that you can always rely on for some support and advice. I remember when I joined Mossig, it was in 2016, uh, and that's when I joined the, the the committee. I didn't know anyone on the committee or in Mossig, and everyone was so welcoming. You know, I, I immediately felt like you know a part of that yeah. wonderful group of people. So I think it's very important to have this support system, someone you can ask even, you know, questions that you think might be silly to mm -hmm. ask, you know, but you feel comfortable enough with those people so that you can ask even the, the, the silliest questions that you have yeah, about writing. Definitely. And is there any other advice or tips that you'd give to a teacher who's perhaps looking to write their own materials or someone who's been doing it for a long time? Is there anything else that you'd add? I think that... The only thing I would like to, to say is always think about the learners, always think about the students. It's not about the number of copies you want to sell. It's not about the number of hours you invest um, into writing uh, materials. Think about what you want to achieve with your materials, with your students and those who use your uh, published uh, materials. Um, I think that we need to put the, the learners, students uh, in the center of this process. Nothing else matters. If they are not happy uh, using your materials, if the teachers are not happy using your materials, then it's not worth it, to be honest. So I think that that's the, the thing we need to keep in mind. Students, learners, and teachers who use your materials. Even if you write for your own classroom, also be generous and share your materials with other teachers who might not have the time or the skills to write their own materials. Yeah. Um, and we as teachers, I think that we are the kind of people who like to share with others. Otherwise, we wouldn't be teachers. Yeah, exactly. So teachers and materials writers are people that influence the, the education directly, mm -hmm. you know, the education of young minds. So we should be very generous and we should put the students in the center of the process of writing materials. And um, what about you? Are you working on anything that you'd like to share? Or Well, right now I am working on a series of blog posts. I'm finally going back to my blog. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I never seem to have um, the right focus or state of mind to do like you know, write every week or every month, but now yeah. I've decided uh, that um, I need to do that because there are some things that I would like to share with uh, others. Um, I'm also working on a um, course book uh, for adult students, for beginners. Um, I'm also working on some stories. Um, as, as I've said before, I like uh, writing stories. So that's something that I'm working on. And of course, I'm getting ready for uh, Belfast next year you know the ITFL annual conference and Mossig of course um, uh, is there every year so um, that's that's uh, what I'm doing uh, at the moment. Great and how can anyone um, read these blog posts that you're going to share? Well I have a blog it's called um, ELT Shouts mm -hmm. it's um, it's a blog that I started I don't know how long ago but as I said um, I uh, haven't been writing uh, regularly, but now I've decided I want to do that because 
I believe that I have stories to share. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I always say is that there are no single stories. So I want to introduce people to stories from different countries, different places uh, that they don't usually read about in Mm -hmm. ELT materials. So that's why I um, wrote this last blog post and then uh, I'm going to start like a like a series of short posts um, about um, different places around the world and what right. we could uh, learn about them through ELT materials. That sounds really interesting. It's really good. We'll share a link to um, your blog thanks. as well along with this episode. That'd be good so people can yeah, have a look. Thanks, Billy. Thank you. Um, so thank, thank you, you so much for your time and for all your tips and advice and I hope that any new teachers or teachers that have been writing for a long time really do consider themselves materials writers. Like you said, it's really, really important just to feel confident in what you're doing and to to keep at it as well. I hope so too. Thank you very much, Billy, for the invitation. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. So thanks so much for listening to today's episode. We'll be sharing the links Alex mentioned along with this episode on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. So do be sure to follow us on there if you're not already at ELTCPD or one word. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube for our episodes and you can show your support for the show by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash ELTCPD. Every penny counts towards bringing you free ELTCPD sessions through our podcasts. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you for the next mini series.